Last year, the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission wowed audiences across the world. As they photographed a comet up close and personal. The spacecraft then went on to explore, map, analyze, and even land on Comet 67P. This Return to Rosetta episode will reveal what we've learned from that landing and get the latest on the spacecraft's adventures as it travels with the comet into the inner solar system. ESA's Rosetta mission is considered to be one of the most audacious space missions to date. It is very technologically impressive. Last summer, Rosetta arrived at Comet 67P Cheremeyev Gerasimenka after a journey lasting 10 years and more than 6 billion kilometers. After mapping and exploring the surface for two months, Rosetta gently dropped its lander, Philae, onto the surface. It bounced, but it returned remarkable results. Some of the teams running that onboard instrumentation are based here at the Open University, and we've come to find out what they've learned. And with Philae safely deployed, Rosetta continues to fly around the comet, returning spectacular images and unprecedented science. In this programme, we'll catch up with Rosetta's project scientist, Matt Taylor. He'll reveal how the comet is changing as it hurtles towards the sun. That's what makes the mission so exciting. We've never done this before. We'll learn about the lander Philae's remarkable reawakening. Cometry expert Alan Fitzsimmons deciphers some of the stunning images from the mission. This is incredible flying by the mission control team. It's absolutely beautiful. And Pete Lawrence reveals comet-related highlights in the night sky. We were there last year in Mission Control with project scientist Matt Taylor when the lander was deployed and we followed the ensuing nail-biting drama. But more on that later. First, one of Rosetta's key missions is to watch the comet change, finding out how it evolves from being a frozen lump of ice to an active and dynamic world with an atmosphere that we call a coma. Matt Taylor has the latest. The coma is the only part of a comet that we can actually see from down here on Earth. It's their telltale signature, the bright shining glow that appears and grows into a tail stretching across the night sky. For years, comets have fascinated mankind. Over the millennia, they've been portents of some great event. And in more modern times, we've been fascinated by the way the coma, the outer atmosphere of the comet, grows and then dies away as it moves away from the sun. For the first time, Rosetta is witnessing this as it happens. Part of Rosetta's instrumentation studying the coma was built here at Imperial College London. So it's a great place to explore what comas really are. The coma is a temporary atmosphere of a comet made of gas and rocky dust. And we're interested to find out exactly what it's made of and how that can tell us more about the comet and the solar system itself. A fundamental question is where the coma actually comes from. For the first time with Rosetta, we can actually see how the icy comet itself is turning into a cloud of gas and dust. Let me show you what we think is happening. This is frozen carbon dioxide or dry ice. And along with other ices, they form a major component of a cometary nucleus. You can see the gas coming off of the surface of this dry ice at the moment. This process is called sublimation, whereby the solid ice transfers directly into a gas. And this is exactly what we see happening at the comet, where the gas lifts off of the cometary nucleus and brings with it a number of other particles of rocky dust. And that's what gives us this fantastic outer atmosphere, this coma. When the comet is on the outskirts of the solar system, there's little sublimation going on. But as we move closer to the sun, 
the sublimation really begins to kick off. The sun's heat turns more and more of the comet's ice into a massive cloud of gas. Comets are in fact some of the largest objects in the whole solar system. The nucleus of 67P is only four kilometers long, but its coma is already around 100,000 kilometers across. Rosetta is riding alongside this body as it's spewing all of this stuff out. It's currently around 200 kilometers from the cometary nucleus, so it's inside the coma, right next to the most active part of this system. And that's what makes the mission so exciting. We've never done this before. We're there to observe this happening in real time. We'll see the comet change from an inert object to something that's so dynamic and so active. Until now, seeing this has only been possible from Earth-based telescopes. And that's the real beauty of the Rosetta mission. We can compare the detailed picture we're getting close up with the larger scale view we get from the Earth. Dr. Colin Snodgrass coordinates the Earth-based observations of Comet 67P. So one of the major things that we're sometimes concerned but also interested with, with Rosetta, as you know, is the dust. So for us, we're trying to avoid it but also detect it. From a ground-based observing perspective, what, what is dust to you around a comet? Well, dust for, uh, from the ground observer is actually most of what we see for a comet. Because a comet, when you see an, one in a telescope, you see it from Earth, um, you see the, the coma and the tail, but most of the light you're seeing is sunlight reflected back from these, these, the dust, from the, the clouds of dust. OK, so we're coming up to perihelion in August. This is when the comet is closest to the sun. And we've got the capability from amateur astronomers to also observe the comet, which gives us many more points to, to, to refer to. Yes, the amateurs will actually have a very important role to play this year because sometimes having a smaller telescope is actually an advantage when you're trying to observe against a bright sky. Um, and that also because they can point low down. Anyone that has a low horizon to the east is able to get uh, images lower down than the most professional telescopes can point. And they also get these very wide field images. I mean, most professional telescopes, again, also are designed to, to do spectroscopy or take images of a very small patch of the sky. Um, whereas, as the comet is close to perihelion, it's a relatively large structure. So having wide field images from many amateurs spread across the globe will actually get a very nice coverage of what this comet's doing and understand the, the very large scale. It's a really nice addition to, to the international collaboration that we already have with Rosetta, from Europe to America to everywhere. With the amateur, it's, it's spread that net all it's, around the world. Yes, there are people all over the world already taking images of the comet, and it is going to get brighter over the next month. A key task of Rosetta has been to look at the type of water on the comet, comparing the isotopic signature of the water up there with what we find down here. Could comets have delivered water to Earth? Or did it come from closer to home, carried by asteroids from the inner parts of the solar system? One of the things that we've seen recently with Rosetta is measuring the different types of water off of the comet. And we show that comets may not have been a major component in the delivery of water to the Earth. This is definitely one of the, the ongoing debates. And I think that it's still the case that you know, some comets definitely did hit the Earth as it was forming and pr clearly delivered some water. But yes, maybe the Rosetta result indicates that more of the water came from the asteroid belt, in particular the outer asteroid belt. So and this is between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter? Right? Yes, so the asteroid belt now is a, is a region where there's a lots and lots of small bodies there that we originally thought were just dry and rocky, whereas comets were icy and had water in them. Um, but over the last 10 years or so, we've also been discovering that there is water in the outer asteroid belt, and in some ways it was easier for asteroids from this region to reach the Earth than it was for comets to reach the Earth when the Earth was forming. So that, that in some ways, is, is an easier picture to put together and say, OK, the water from Earth maybe came more from this region, from the asteroid belt region, than primarily from comets. So actually, one of the, one of the nice things with this Rosetta result is that it's really saying, this comet itself is very, very old. That's, that's what this measurement gives us. And it's, it's different, a different set of materials that are in this comet to what we find on Earth. And it also kind of muddies the water in our understanding of, of cometary evolution. I think that's, that's kind of cool. Yes, it is. And what Rosetta is telling us doesn't necessarily apply just to Comet 67P, because the multiple different observations of this comet 
will help improve our understanding of all comets. Perhaps the most important aspect of Rosetta is this capability of calibrating ground-based observations. Rosetta is there up close and personal to the comet, and we're understanding so much more with these observations, and we apply those to our ground-based observations of the same comet. We can then extend that to all of the other observations we have of comets in history and in the future, and have a fantastically better understanding of how comets work. Comets are wonderful and sometimes weird things. The coma often grows into more than one tail. To find out why this happens, go to the Sky at Night website, where you'll see how the two tails can even end up pointing in opposite directions. While the Rosetta spacecraft has been busy analysing the atmosphere of 67P, the lander, Philae, has been sitting on the comet's surface since November last year. There was real drama surrounding the landing, when the landing gear failed to deploy, allowing Philae to bounce slowly three times over the surface. It finally came to a stop, as far as we can tell, on uneven ground in the shadow of a cliff. With too little sunlight to recharge its batteries, as planned, there was a race to get as much science done before the main battery died. After three short days, Philae went into hibernation mode and all went quiet. But today, seven months later, Philae has woken up. So how has this happened? Well, to get the computers to reboot, we need two main things. Firstly, the solar panels need to be generating at least 5.5 watts of power. Secondly, the internal temperature needs to be above minus 45 degrees. Currently, the sunlight is hitting the top of the lander. But in the coming months, from June to September, that light will be moving further round, lighting up the solar panels, giving us that much needed power. Philae is in great shape. The temperature is a balmy minus 35 degrees C, and it has 24 watts of power available, more than enough to get some science done. What it told us back in November has already thrown up surprises. The multiple readings prove that the comet has no magnetic field. Because comets are the leftovers from the early solar system, this suggests that magnetism was not the main force helping material clump together to start to form the planets. Most exciting for the team here at the Open University was the data that streamed in from Ptolemy, their instrument on board Philae. Last week, I spoke to Simon Sheridan. Simon, you're co-investigator on Ptolemy, which is a mass spectrometer. Can you tell me what a mass spectrometer will do on the surface of a comet? Yeah, certainly. A mass spec, in its simplest form, it's a way of actually measuring the mass and concentration of atoms and molecules. So um, what we've actually done is we've shrunk down a an instrument you see in the lab around us here, and we've actually shrunk it down to a small size, about this kind of size, so we can actually do that analysis to find out what is floating around on the surface of the comet or below this comet. So this is chemical composition? Yes. Our primary aim was to actually try and get a solid sample from below the surface, and, uh, and, and also we were going to look to the organics in, in that sample. Um, as you know, things didn't actually work out as, as we'd hoped for, but uh, we still got a really lot of really good, good data from the instrument. So um, you did get some data. Mm. And so what sort of results did you get? Well, it was really interesting because when we hit and we bounced, we were obviously in mid-flight, and our instrument came on because it was programmed to come on automatically. Oh, after, oh, after, after contact? After 20 minutes, yeah. So in those 20 minutes, after 20 minutes, we were going to turn the instrument on and just check everything out to make sure it all worked so we were ready. And obviously at that time, the, 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 space, the, sorry, the lander was tumbling, rotating, uh, and there was a real concern that the whole mission may be lost. But as that was happening, we, we were getting data coming back to our instrument. So we are like, well, something's working. <laughs> and then when we bounced, we got a lot of organic material uh, that actually got into the mass spectrometer some way. And we, we're not completely sure what happened, but we think when the lander hit, it stirred up the organic material, and that was very cold. So some of that's actually stuck to the, the actual um, lander itself. And then as we were bouncing across the surface, we think that was like subliming off. So we, we were like sniffing that 
mid bounce. I see detecting it as you were um, yes, yeah. as you were flying. Yeah. Oh, I see it. So what sort of results have you got? Well, in that first bounce, we we we, we sample a lot of organic material. So this is carbon-based material. Yes, exactly, carbon-based material. But it, it's really intriguing because that first time we, we touched down, as I'm just saying, we we stirred up a lot of that organic material which we've analysed, and then where we've come to rest now is in a very different place to what we actually touched down on. The original site is very, very active, a lot, lot of material there. Where we are now, it's a very inactive place and it's completely different to where, where we actually touched down. So certainly with Ptolemy, what we've been able to do is we've been able to look at the gases that are, are coming off through the surface and we're seeing completely different signatures in gases. The finding of organic material on the comet confirms previous analysis from Earth. But the variation in the chemical composition across the surface is a new discovery. This is the first time we've had this level of insight into the construction of a comet. So were there any other benefits of the bounce? Yes, yeah, certainly. Originally, we would have landed on this nice plain surface in sunlight, and we probably got about a month, two months worth of data. And then we would have overheated and the, the batteries would have exploded and the, the land would have been destroyed. But because where we are now, we're shielded, and we believe that if we wake up in the, in the coming weeks, then we should be able to actually measure the comet during its, on its way into the sun during peak activity, and then as it comes around the sun and starts switching off again, we should be able to monitor that on the way back out as well. Fantastic, so you'll get a much better understanding yeah. of the comet. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. There are plenty of treats in the night sky, and Pete has all the details. The light evenings of the summer months aren't always great for stargazing, but they do mean we have a chance to see a stunning byproduct of comets. About an hour after sunset, you might see, towards the northern half of the sky, wisps of golden, white or electric blue clouds that are obviously bright against the darkening sky. These are called noctilucent clouds. These clouds are essentially a thin veil of water ice up in the highest reaches of our atmosphere, up in the mesosphere as it's called. Now, they're about 50 miles up, which is about seven times the height of the highest normal clouds. And here, they're right on the edge of space. Now, the reason why noctilucent clouds appear to shine at night is that even though the sun is below the horizon for you, they're so high up, they can still see the sun and reflect its light back to you. So they appear to shine even in the darkness of night. Now, if there are any normal clouds around, they look dark and silhouetted against the twilight. All clouds need something, such as a speck of dust, for the water droplets or ice crystals to form around. The normal clouds form around particles which have been lifted up into the atmosphere from the Earth's surface. But it's really difficult to waft dust particles right up into the mesosphere. Now, some scientists believe that the particles which populate that really thin layer in the mesosphere in which noctilucent clouds form may have come from, amongst other things, comets and asteroids. And it's fairly easy to photograph them with a standard camera. Another night sky object linked to comets that you can photograph relatively easily are shooting stars or meteors. Meteor showers are predictable events which occur when the Earth passes through the dust trail left behind by a comet in its orbit. Now what happens is the tiny particles of dust, typically the size of a grain of sand, will come through the Earth's atmosphere and they vaporize. And the result of that is a streak of light which we know as a meteor. The next big shower will be the Perseids in late July and August. But individual meteors, known as sporadic meteors, can occur at any time, sometimes up to 10 per hour. There's a lot of comet dust up there. Now, I can't do a comet-themed star guide without showing you at least one real comet. Unfortunately, 67P isn't very well positioned at the moment, and it's quite faint, but its position will improve throughout the year. Now, it's never going to be the easiest of targets to pick up, but I'm sure many of you are going to have a go. But the one I'm looking out for tonight is much brighter. 
Comet Lovejoy has been in our skies for several months, giving us a spectacular display, and it's now heading back into the outer solar system. Comets are endlessly fascinating, creating such varied objects, both in deep sky and in our own atmosphere. So with details of how to find Comet Lovejoy and what else is happening in the night sky, here's this month's Star Guide. Comet C2014 Q2 Lovejoy is currently moving south, away from Polaris, through the Little Bear Ursa Minor. It passes close to the star Kokab at the end of June, and a telescope or large binoculars will be needed to see it. Another comet, C2014 Q1 Pan Stars, may be visible to the naked eye or binoculars at the start of July. First locate Jupiter close to Venus low in the west shortly after sunset. Then scan right to locate the bright stars Castor and Pollux. The comet should be in the same field of view at the start of July. Finally, to see noctilucent clouds, look low towards the northwest horizon approximately 90 to 120 minutes after sunset or a similar time before sunrise, look low towards the northeast. There's no guarantee they'll be visible, but if they are there, they can be quite mesmerizing. So back to the Rosetta mission itself, and as well as all the science, it's been providing us with wonderful images of the comet. And here to take us through them is comet expert and friend of the sky at night, Alan Fitzsimmons. Alan, welcome back. Thank you. Well, let's start with this image. This is from February, and this is how I think of the comet. It's wonderful, isn't it? Oh, uh, it's beautiful. What you can see here is the, the nucleus in all its glory, plus the material that's been ejected from the sunlight heating the subsurface ices. And in particular, what you can see is that at this time, most of the material was being ejected from this neck region between the smaller head and the larger body. And you can see this very clearly with this material coming out. When you look at this image, you, you might see these, all these white dots all over the image. They're not background stars. Most of those are particles of comet dust. Really? I, mean, I, I, I thought absolutely. that was a star field. No. I was convinced this was the comet absolutely. hanging in yeah. space. Yeah, and... you, you can't recognise the constellation here, I'm afraid, because these are much larger particles, some of them maybe several centimetres across. We can also see that it's changing. So that was February. Here's May's image, and the activity is very different. Absolutely. What we can see now is that there's activity from the entire surface. So why is that? What's changed? Now with the comet so close to the sun, the entire surface is warm enough that even though most of the surface has no free ice on it, the heat can penetrate to the subsurface ice layers and that's driving the material through the surface that we see of. Some of it's coming through cracks, some of it's coming through pits, some of it may be just wafting up gently through pores in the surface. It's exactly what I always thought an active comet would look like. So this is the broad view, but of course we've got an intensely detailed view uh, of the surface from Rosetta as well. So we get lots of images like this one. This picture I know caused a lot of excitement. What do oh, we see here? Oh, absolutely, and we see a lot of different terrain in this image, but up to the left we see this raised area, this plateau, and along the edge of that plateau we see distinct layering. And this is incredibly important because we know on Earth when we see layering, we see strata, that must be caused either by deposition of, of rock and material in the oceans or by volcanic activity. I mean, the point is that if you see layering, it's something that's happened again and again and again because each layer represents one episode Ex exactly. of whatever process is causing it. Exactly, that's right. But we know that the normal processes on Earth don't operate to produce layers on a comet. So there's two possibilities, and probably the strongest possibility at the moment is that we're seeing a sign of the comet's formation. When this object formed in the outer solar system billions of years ago, uh, it would have formed by gentle collisions, but those collisions would have still kicked out a lot of material. And a lot one, of dust. A lot of dust. Now again, most of that dust ends up floating away, but some of it floats back down onto the surface, helps build up the comet, and one could imagine collision after collision, building up the comet in these layers or these strata. And this could be a sign of those strata that have since been revealed to us because now the comet's undergoing erosion. We know that at the moment it's losing much more material 
each time it goes around the sun than actually falls back onto the surface. So it's, it's getting smaller every time it goes around the sun. And these old layers are coming back to the surface. Absolutely. So we're seeing the past history of the comet revealed. And we've even had a glimpse at its interior. So I know this is a, a, a fabulous image. The exciting thing is that if you look particularly over to the left-hand side of the pit, so you can see this nodular structure. You've got these, these little balls, these, basically. These little balls, they're about two or three metres across, so, so pretty So large. not that little, that's yeah. sort of this sort of size. Absolutely, you, you do have difficulty putting your arms around them. But the important thing is that Rosetta sees these wherever it sees exposed surfaces looking into the inside and interior of the comet, mm. which implies that these are fundamental building blocks of the comet. And it could be that we're seeing signs here of the first objects that formed in our solar system. So the natural size for these things is a few metres across? Absolutely. Now there's some work going on that implies that these two or three metre boulders themselves are composed themselves of smaller pebble-sized objects. Mm. And so we could be getting our first measurements of the real way that Mother Nature makes boulders, then comets, larger objects and finally planets like the Earth. They're remarkably uniform, aren't they? It's the one thing you can see from this image is that each of those balls is about the same size. That's right. Whatever the physical process is controlling that size, it's pretty uniform. And that should give us really good clues into the actual forces and, and physical processes going on to make these early objects. Well, one last image. I, I love this shot. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. This is the image taken by Rosetta as it did its close flyby of the surface on Valentine's Day this year. And the first thing you notice is this black splodge at the bottom, which is the shadow of the spacecraft itself. It's gorgeous. It's a Rosetta selfie, if you like. And here it's just six kilometers from the surface. Now, to put that into context, my flight over to see you today was higher above the surface of the Earth, uh, 30,000 feet, than Rosetta was flying above the surface of the comet. So this is incredible flying by the mission control team. It's absolutely beautiful. That's all for this month. We'll bring you another programme later in the air with all the news from the most dangerous and unpredictable phase of Rosetta's mission, its closest approach to the sun. Next month, it will be the 750th episode of The Sky at Night, so we've got a very special programme. We'll be following NASA's New Horizons spacecraft as it encounters the hidden world of Pluto and its moons. This will be our first proper look at the surface of a world that we all learn about in school, and it promises to be breathtaking. We'll be at Mission Control in America for all of the action, so don't miss it. Meanwhile, get outside and get looking up. Good night. For more information on today's exciting news about Philae, go to the Sky at Night website for the latest from Chris.